Today, we're looking at the book of Zechariah. Zechariah is a priest and a prophet. So not the father of John the Baptist, because that's the most popular Zechariah that we know. As I was speaking to some kids, I was saying, Prophet Zechariah, they said, yeah, John the Baptist's dad. No, not John the Baptist's dad. He's a priest and a prophet, the one we're talking about today. This Zechariah, we first saw him in the book of Ezra. So if you haven't seen my video, Ezra, you can have a look so you can get the full background to this story. So in the book of Ezra, just going back a bit, King Cyrus of Persia had told all the people that were captured by the Babylonians that they cannot go back home to their nations, go and rebuild their temples and pray to their gods for him. So this was prophesied by Prophet Jeremiah in the book of Jeremiah that the people will be in exile for 70 years and they will go back home. So the Babylonians were overpowered by Persian Empire, which Jeremiah prophesied, and the king, Cyrus, he said they can all go back home. So when they went back to Jerusalem, not all of them went back, just a few out of all the millions that were taken in captivity, because 70 years is a long time. So they built businesses. Most of the people that were taken into captivity originally had died. These are the children and the grandchildren that were born in Babylon. They don't know Jerusalem, so they don't want to go. So a few of them decided to go back and rebuild the city. So when they got back, the first thing they did was build an altar where they worshipped Yahweh and thanked him for his faithfulness and for keeping his promise that the people will go back to their land. And then they started the work of rebuilding the temple. When they laid the foundation, there were three sets of people that came to Zerubbabel and the other returnees to ask that they also want to join in in building the temple. When they went back to Jerusalem, the land was not completely empty. There were some people who were in the land that when the Babylonians came to capture the people, they ran for it. They went to the hills, they went to the mountains, they went to neighboring cities. They were not captured. After the Babylonians had gone and taken away the majority of the people, this set of people came back. The Samaritans were also in the land. These are Jews, but not pure Jews. They got mixed blood. They were still there. And then the third set of people that were in Jerusalem were those people that King Esarsedon sent to go and occupy Samaria after the people had been taken into captivity. So these three sets of people were in the land. And they were the ones who came and said they would like to join in in rebuilding the temple. But Zerubbabel and the other returnees refused their help and said, no, we are absolutely fine. We don't want you to help. King Cyrus said the returnees should come. You're not one of us. We don't need your help. So these people were not happy that their, their help was spared. They felt aggrieved. So they sent word to the king of Persia that these people who have come back to come and rebuild their lands, to come and rebuild the city, to rebuild the wall. Once they've rebuilt the city, they're not going to pay tribute to you anymore. They're not going to pay tax to you. They are going to form their own nation back again. They will have their own king. They will not pay taxes. So the king, Sexes, sent a message immediately that they should stop rebuilding the temple. They should cease and halt all the work. So the people stopped rebuilding. For almost 20 years, they stopped rebuilding the temple. Nobody cared anymore. It wasn't even in their hearts. They were not grieved about it. They started to rebuild their own homes, their houses, their businesses, their empires. No one bothered. And in the book of Ezra, we can see that Haggai and Zechariah now came up. The Lord stirred them up and they now told the people, come on, what you're doing is wrong. You can't just concentrate on your own homes and leave the temple unbuilt. It's still in ruins. Since Babylon came and conquered the land, it's still there. We have to do something. So now this is going like 100 years. You can't just leave the temple 
you know, so they poured up the people and the work began. So in the book of Haggai, we saw Haggai's story about how he ministered, mustered up the people to start the temple. And now in the book of Zechariah, we're going to see how Zechariah also played his own part, his own role in bolstering of the people to start the work again in rebuilding the temple. Now, the book of Zechariah is different to the other minor prophets. He talks about the past, he talks about the future, and he talks about the present. So it's a different book, quite interesting book, and completely different to the other minor prophets. Most of the minor prophets, they talk to like Edom or to Nineveh, you know, to Judah or to Israel, you know, kind of like current things. But Zechariah, he also talks about the future things like the birth of the Messiah, the Messiah coming on a donkey and stuff. You know, he talks about the things that will happen in the future, the judgment on the world and stuff. So it's really different. So some scholars think the book of Zechariah was written by three Zacharias. They feel that it, it, it's not all like the same genre. It's different writing. That, you know, that it can't be one Zechariah who wrote it. We don't know. It says the book of Zechariah, so it's the book of Zechariah. So Zechariah means God remembers. Yahweh remembers. So Zechariah begins his prophecy by telling the people who are now who have now returned to the land, God remembers what your forefathers did. They did not listen to the prophets. They did not listen. The prophets were sent to them to warn them. They did not heed to the warning. And eventually they were now taken into captivity as the prophets had foretold. If they had listened to the prophets, all this wouldn't have befallen on you guys. Now you guys are back in the land because God kept his promise that we will come back. Now I want you, Lord, this new generation to listen to the prophets. When we speak to you, listen and take heed. We speak as God gives us utterance. We speak as he sends us to speak. We don't speak for the fun of it and we don't speak out of our flesh. So once the prophet speaks, listen. So he starts his prophecy by cautioning the people that they are now back, they need to listen. Now, Zechariah, his, his prophecies are in forms of visions that God shows him. He shows him visions. And I think there's a total of eight visions that God shows him. And these are the visions he relates to the people. So even in the book, when Zechariah is sleeping, he says God woke him up to show him the vision. Because if God shows him when he's asleep, that would be a dream. That won't be a vision. So God actually wakes him up. And then while he's awake, he now sees the picture clearly. And then he relates this to the people. So he sees visions, which is completely different from dreams. Dreams is when you're asleep. Visions is when you are awake. And you just see a picture or you see a video, a film flash right before your eyes while you're awake so he sees visions so the first vision he sees are of four horsemen and their riders he sees visions of four horsemen and their riders and these horsemen these riders are like god's policemen they are policing the whole earth they are going up and down and feeding god back Telling God that this is what's happening here, this is what's happening there. They're like, so they are angels, so which proves the point that there is a spiritual world out there. This isn't it, this is the physical, there are spiritual, there's a spiritual world, there's spiritual beings surrounding us that we can't see, but they are seeing us. So as we're walking about, they are there, they are the good ones and they're the bad ones. So which means, which is very important before you go out you leave your house in the mornings to go on your daily business you need to pray you pray a wall of protection around you around your family around your children even while they're going to school because this spirit world is there some are for good 
you know, as protection. Some are evil. They're just out there to steal, to kill, and destroy. So we need to pray and cover ourselves you know, as a protection. And the Lord God Almighty will protect us as we go about our daily business because we do not see. Unless we pray, God should open our spiritual eyes and then we can see all these spiritual forces that are around us. You remember Gehazi when the prophet had to pray that God should open his eyes and then he saw that the mountainside was full of chariots, warriors, soldiers that have come to fight the battle and he relaxed. So, and then in his second vision, he sees four horns and four carpenters. Now horns typically means strength, you know, strength or aggression. If you've seen animals that have horns, when they are fighting, they lock horns, they're aggressive, they use their horns to fight. Some animals have to be dehorned so that they are not a danger to people and to themselves. And sometimes these horns prevent some animals from being able to feed because it it gets caught in the bushes and they can't eat and they find a way and they die. So some animals have to be dehorned as a result. So horns is a signal of, um, a symbol of strength and aggression. So these four horns, it could mean, the four could mean that the cup of iniquity is full because if you remember in the book of Amos, God says, for three transgressions, even for four. For three sins, even for four. So when it goes even for four, that means your cup of iniquity is full. So it's four, it's complete. You know, so these four horns could be that it, it, it means that the cup of iniquity is full. Or it could be four nations that it's meaning like um, Babylon, Persia, Greek and the Roman Empire that you know and then the four carpenters they cut off these horns so it could be that the vision means that those four carpenters will cut down these four nations because they were toppled they were overthrown anyway so we so we don't know exactly if it means these four nations that were so powerful they will be cut down by the uh, carpenters or that the cup of iniquity is full he also sees in his third vision a measuring line. Usually, a measuring line is about judgment. When you say measuring line, it's judgment. But in this vision, it's not judgment. It's a reward. You know, so God is measuring the city to increase it. So he's measuring it to increase it. So God will return back to Jerusalem. And he himself, Yahweh, will be the wall surrounding Jerusalem. So he sees the measuring line. In his fourth vision is the cleansing of the high priest Joshua. Because Satan, the accuser of the brethren, he stands and says, Joshua cannot be the high priest. His garment is filthy. So he has no right. You know, that's what the devil does. You kneel down in prayer and he drops it into your mind. You can't pray. You did this. You did that. You did this. And immediately you stop your prayers. You don't do that. Immediately you tell him, get deep behind me. And you tell him, God has forgiven my sins and he has forgotten it. So this is what the devil does. So the devil came and said, no, Joshua cannot stay there. So it's likely it's a symbol that Joshua's filthy garment is is the sins of Israel you know but an angel removes that garment that filthy garment and he's put a clean garment so that could mean Israel's sins have now been removed they are now cleansed they are now a holy people because the devil could be saying Israel cannot be your people they are wicked they are sinful you know how can you choose them so they are now cleansed so that could be mean that vision the fifth vision he sees lambs and olive trees lambs and olive trees which is um, 
the temple is the lamp because the oil you know the oil on the in the menorah the lamps they never run out it's always burning in the temple and the olive trees two olive trees is Zerubbabel and Joshua and there the Lord makes a covenant that the hands of Zerubbabel has started building this temple and he will complete rebuilding the temple so sometimes when you start a project you can use that as a prayer to say Lord as my hands have started this project according to what you told, said about Zerubbabel my hands will also complete this project you know you can use it as a prayer there's nothing wrong about it because it's positive you know and he said uh, to Zerubbabel it's not by power it's not by might but it's by the spirit of the Lord so it's not by power it's not going to rebuild the temple by horses and chariots and stuff it's not by might it's not by the political power but it's by the spirit of the Lord so this uh, the first five visions that Zechariah sees the sixth vision he sees a flying scroll this scroll is flying and it's a divine judgment on Israel and the other Gentile nations so the, the, the judgment is on those who steal and those who lie so this scroll goes and passes judgment on anyone who steals and lies but I've read somewhere that it's not just on stealing, steal, uh, thieves and liars, but it's the whole, the whole law, the whole law, you know. So it's not just for those who steal and those who lie. There will be divine judgment on them. So a curse goes out upon all these people. So that was that flying screw. So that's a lesson for us that we should pray every day. God should forgive us and have mercy. And the Holy Spirit should enable us to live right. We can't do it by our own strength. And so far we have this flesh, we will sin. But when we sin, you go on your knees, ask God for forgiveness, ask him for mercy, and he will forgive you. You don't have to continue in that sin. Let's say, for instance, you met an ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend. You went to the, their place, one thing led to the other. You ended up in bed you then don't say afterwards that oh well we've done it now we might as well continue no 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 no. that's the wrong thing to do especially if you are now a christian you know and that was a slip a blip you go on your knees you pray for forgiveness and you ask the holy spirit to help you so next time you will learn your lesson when they invite you to their house you run you know you don't go there but you can't say, because you've done it once, let me continue. You know, you are just digging a grave for yourself. You ask for forgiveness, and the Lord will forgive you. And then he sees the seventh vision, which is of a woman in a basket. And that woman is wickedness, that woman is sin. And there was another vision of two other creatures who came and carried that basket with the woman and carried it off to Babylon. So that's um, Israel's sins being carried off to Babylon. So cleansing the whole land. And the final vision, the eighth one, he saw four chariots. And these four chariots are divine judgment on the Gentile nations. So as I said, the book of Zechariah is completely different to the other minor prophets. He sees visions. And he sees visions of things to come and even of things that have passed and then three jews arrive from babylon and they make joshua a crown so they make this crown because kings and priests they work in harmony you know and jesus had both roles he, he was a priest he was a king he was a prophet so they make a crown for Joshua. So some people now arrived and they asked the Zechariah about the fast. Because when they were away in captivity, they were always fasting. They had their special months when they had to fast. And the fasting was because they are now in exile. So they were fasting 
you know, during the time of exile. That now that we are back in our land, do we still need to fast? Because we are back now. You know, we're no longer in exile. We're no longer in captivity. Do we need to fast? And Zechariah asked, that fast, who were you fasting for? You were not fasting for God. That was just your own ritual that you were doing. You know, you don't show mercy. You don't have compassion. You have hard hearts. You don't forgive. And you say you are fasting. Who is the fasting for? You are wasting your time. So that fasting wasn't for God anyway. You were just keeping a protocol that, okay, every month I have to do this fast. Every month I have to, and some Christians are like that. They say every week I have to fast one day. Then it becomes a ritual. They just every Tuesday, okay, I have to fast. They're just fasting for fasting's sake. What they're doing is they just, they don't eat. That's all they, that they are fasting. But they... They don't pray for repentance. They don't have a contrite and a broken heart. They don't come to God in genuine repentance during that fast. It's a waste of time. That's not a fast. That's just starving yourself anyway. So that's not the fast that God asks for. And if you also read Isaiah, it talks about the fast that God asks for. When you are fasting, that food that you are not eating at that time, is supposed to go and give it to the hungry people. But you don't, you pile it up on your dining table, looking at the time. Immediately it's time to break the fast. You go there and you feast. That's not a fast. You know, that is not a fast. So Zechariah was telling them that that wasn't a fast. So he said there will be a glorious regathering of all Israel. Wherever they have been scattered, they will all come back. And that's still happening even today in our day. That there's this aliyah going on and people... Israelites, Hebrews, Jews from all over the world are being flown back to Israel, even as we speak. And there's a DNA testing going on in a tribe in Nigeria. They say maybe they could be one of the lost tribes. So they're doing all this testing to see if they are, they will just fly them all out to Israel. You know, and they, they will all come back together. They will all come back together. God has said it, you know, so it will happen. And it is happening, you know, so... And then from chapters 9 to 14, scholars are saying it's different from the first eight chapters. So it can't be Zechariah who wrote it, maybe it's second Zechariah. I don't know. But in that one, he, he prophesies about Jesus. So it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. He talks about the arrival of the Messiah. He talks about Jesus riding on a donkey. He talks about the, the lost sheep of Israel. But they reject the shepherd. They do not. They they do not respond to him. They treat him bad. They pay him thirty shekels. This thirty shekels is normally the fee for a slave, and you know that thirty shekels reminds us of Judas. You know, so if you see what all what he's saying, this definitely, without a shadow of a doubt, is a pointer to Jesus. So they knew. So there's no way they will say they don't know. So. And when they saw him, the Jews would normally have known about these prophets. They rejected him. They went after the shepherds who were no shepherds. They went after the shepherds who misled them, who treated them badly. And they rejected the one true shepherd that God had spoken about. He was there, right there in the Bible, but they rejected him. So then finally, it talks about Jerusalem being attacked, but God will give them victory, total victory, and they shall repent for piercing Christ, for crucifying him, because all eyes will see and they will repent. And then the, the last battle, there'll be the final day of God's judgment, and all the remnants will turn back to God. And God always leaves a remnant. No matter when, no matter how, he always leaves a remnant. If you remember prophet Elijah, when he was praying and he was crying because he was running away from Jezebel, they wanted to kill him. And he said, God, I'm the only one left. All the others are fake. They're all prophets of Baal. And God said, no, you're not the only one left. I have been said for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So you're not the only one left. So no matter what, in, in our time, every time, God always leaves a remnant those who will worship him in truth and in spirit. 
So this is the book of Zechariah. As I said, it's a completely different book. So if you, for more background, you can watch my video on Ezra and Haggai to know about the prophet Haggai, to know about the prophet Zechariah. Thank you for watching. You can consider subscribing to my channel so that when I upload more videos, you will get a notification. It's free, completely free. You don't have to pay. God bless you. Bye.